Okay, I'm very excited to have on the show Josh Luber, who is the co-founder and CEO of StockX, but much more exciting for those of you who don't know what StockX is. Josh is probably one of the world's foremost experts in the business of sneakers. Josh, real pleasure to have you. Thanks for having me. So, you know, a lot of the times on this show, we talk about things like stocks and bonds and mutual funds. And I've been getting a little pushback from my producer saying, why are you bringing this guy on who like, is a sneaker guy? So help me construct a good answer for why I'm bringing on a sneaker guy onto a personal finance show. So let's start at the, the highest level, right? Before we even look at the similarities between sneakers and stocks and, and other assets, right? Is So I run a company called StockX, which is uh, the world's first stock market of things. And so we are a consumer marketplace, think eBay or Amazon, but we connect buyers and sellers in the exact same way that the world's stock markets connect buyers and sellers. And we can go through a lot of the, the details or as, or as detailed as you want, but at the highest level, right, it's around that just transparency of data. And all this comes back to data, whether it's for sneakers, whether it's for other things that we sell on StockX, including watches and handbags uh, or where we're going. But it's this concept that, you know, the stock market has been maybe the most efficient form of commerce for hundreds of years. You know, why can't we use that for consumer goods as well? And um, it just so happens that we've started with sneakers and that sneakers fit really, really well, that, that people already buy and sell sneakers and treat sneakers as assets where they're, they're acquiring them and holding them and increasing in value and, and making money in, you know, very traditional sort of arbitrage opportunities. So there's a lot, a lot of um, uh, threads here to between sneakers and data and finance and stock markets. So when I started on Wall Street about 25 years ago, I was in what I like to refer to as stockbroker school, which took place in the Twin Towers. May they rest in peace. One of the things that we did is we, we had a simulation. Where they actually brought in a guy who was a floor broker at, uh, from the stock exchange, and we kind of pretended what you know to feel what it was really like to trade stocks. And half of us were buyers and half of us were sellers, and he had like a little book that he would keep track of the buyers and sellers, and he would match us like, like what happens on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. Is that what you're referring to when you're talking about a marketplace? Absolutely, right? So so StockX is a true live bid ask market, right? So as opposed to say eBay where, you know, if you search for any one shoe, there will be thousands of listings, right? There's one listing for every pair of shoes, right? Just like there's one ticker symbol and every bid and every ask are right there. And when a new shoe comes out, and pretty much every weekend there's a, a, a lot of new sneakers that come out, but when a new Air Jordan comes out, you can see hundreds, sometimes thousands of bids and thousands of asks all at the same place, right, that same single product page, that single stock ticker, coming off the board, matching real time, right? When a bid and ask meet, that transaction happens automatically. And most importantly, right, and the congruence to the stock market, not only the pit, right, where you have two people matching, but it's totally anonymous, right? So you are not buying from a, another person. You're buying from the exchange, right? You're just matching bids and asks at that dollar amount. And when they meet, the transaction happens and the, and the next ones come up on the board. So this is what we would refer to as price discovery in that the true value as what the market thinks the true value is of whatever it is, is what's being discovered in this in this event where you match the bid and ask. Absolutely, right? There's no clearer true market value for any consumer goods than what happens on StockX because everybody is at the same place, right? You never have to worry about, uh, you know, essentially channel arbitrage or, you know, about sort of misinformation where certain people understand supply or certain people understand demand and the others don't. It's all there. It's completely transparent. You know, product pages on StockX don't look like consumer you know, e-commerce pages, they look like, you know, Yahoo Finance. They look like, you know, uh, market pages where you can see not only the all the live bids and asks are happening, but historical sales, right? Every sale that's ever happened for that shoe and can look <laughs> at that the same way you look at, you know, the price history for Apple stock. Yeah, this really does sound exactly like how we analyze stocks. So the sneakers, I mean, I understand you trade a lot of different things, but for someone to trade sneakers, it has to be that he's trading exactly the same sneaker, or, you know, the same Air Jordan as the next guy. It's not like, well, my sneakers are a week old or there's something different about it. It's almost like a commodity market where everyone says I'm buying an ounce of gold and that, you know, one ounce of gold in theory should be the same in New York or Chicago or Jerusalem. Well, absolutely. Right. So, you know, we think that there's three sort of main tenets of what stock market commerce looks like. And we talked about two of them already. Right. So transparency 
just this transparency of data and the process of what a live bid ask market looks like. Anonymity, right? The fact that you're not buying from a person, you're buying from an exchange. And the third one, to get to your point, is, you know, we call it authenticity, but it's a combination of, of actually of authenticity and standardization of understanding that this particular sneaker, right, is, and by the way, we only allow the sale of brand new, unworn sneakers on StockX, right, because if a shoe is unworn, then you don't need a description, you don't need pictures, you don't need to, to have someone explain to you what that is. I mean, that is a, a commodity, right? People know exactly what that is. But <laughs> unlike a, say, digital certificate for a share of Apple stock, which you know we have commoditized and we, we understand exactly what that is, with consumer goods, you also then have to check the product. And so every pair of sneakers that's sold on StockX get shipped to us here in Detroit, and we physically authenticate every pair, and then we step it on to the buyer. And there's an extra layer of, of operational process involved, and you know, there's certainly and, – and look, if you're like a 15-year-old kid, like this is the greatest value we offer. Right? We authenticate <laughs> sneakers. You're never going to get a fake sneaker. But to your original uh -huh. point, this is fundamental of the market as a whole. right? This is like table stakes for us because if there's any doubt that what you're getting is not what you think you're getting – that it's a standard, it's it's unworn, and that it's authentic, it changes the perception of value, it changes how much someone's willing to bid for something, and the whole market starts to fall apart. So it really is around that authentication and standardization of what that product is. We are speaking to the authentic Josh Luber himself, who is an authenticator of sneakers, but he's also the co-founder and CEO of StockX. He's been explaining to us how the, the sneaker market that StockX manages or controls or is the center of is very much like the stock market. When people buy sneakers and, and and sell them, do they always take delivery, or are they sometimes just buying and then they wait for the price to go up and then they sell without even dealing with physicals? Yeah, so that, that's a phenomenal question, right? So today, our primary business is absolutely connecting buyers and sellers to exchange a a physical sneaker, right? For that for that buyer to then own that that pair of sneakers. But the way that the market is set up, you can actually facilitate day trading in consumer goods without ever taking possession. And we've done this once so far, right? So we actually worked with Nike and the Cleveland Cavaliers to release LeBron James' first retro sneaker. This is the shoe that he wore during his rookie year in 2003, and Nike was re-releasing it. And Nike released it first on StockX before any other retail channels, which was a huge deal not only for StockX, but just the fact that they were working directly with the secondary market. But we created this package. It was in a sneaker box made out of wood from the Cavaliers championship court, and it included an actual Cavaliers championship ring. All right. And so there were 46 of these packages available. There were seven people that chose to resell them, and they resold those packages without ever taking possession of them. We just maintained them here at our facility. And when they resold it, the new purchaser, they took possession. So for those seven people, they made some of them made thousands of dollars without ever taking wow. possession yeah. of the product. And we don't do that on a daily basis with everything, but it is absolutely the bigger idea of where this can move to as you move closer down that path of becoming more of a, a true marketplace. Well, your marketplace is, is an unregulated market, meaning you're the one in charge and you make the rules. Yep. So you have no regulation. How does that compare to the regulated stock market? Well, that, like, that's exactly why that we don't do this at scale today. You know, this was a, a one off and, and the, the, the projects with Nike and, and LeBron and the Cavs, half the money went to charity and, and was there was mainly, you know, for the PR aspect. You know, if we were to cross that line and allow people to uh, at scale buy and sell consumer goods without ever taking possession, um, we may very well be in the situation of, of having to, to work with the, the SEC or, or the FTC or CFTC or, or someone to make sure <laughs> that we aren't crossing those lines and going down there. And again, today our business is, is marketplace. We're, our better direct competitor is eBay rather than the New York Stock Exchange. But, you know, at some point it may actually make sense to have those conversations and maybe become – registered or figure out what we have to do in order to facilitate this because the bigger idea here is way bigger than just being you know a place for people to buy and sell sneakers mm -hmm. i'm wondering what other sorts of things you mentioned watches before i know you're a big sneakers fan i, I can't say that I, I know as much about the sneaker field well i don't know <laughs> i don't know anything about the sneaker field but i see it as a the way you're describing it you've created it into a commodity what other areas do you think this actually may go into which would have a practical impact for 
normal people who are investors? Yeah. Or is it just for buying? It's just a different way of buying stuff. It, it, it's absolutely just a different way of, of buying and selling. And by the way, you know, if you were to separate StockX and just the way that we've changed buying, there's more efficiency and you have data to make better decisions. And it's definitely a better process. But it is really, really about the selling that, for lack of a sort of less cliche word, is the revolutionary part of this as a consumer marketplace. Because once you have a commoditized product and once you have all bids and asks in one place, well, it enables what we call like sell now, right? This concept that in consumer goods, right, if you want to sell a product, you have to go list it and, and try to get people to come buy it. But if you want to sell a share of Apple stock, you don't have to go list it for sale. You don't have to go find buyers. You go to the market. There's a market price, and you can sell now whenever you want. And everything else we've talked about enables that for consumer goods as well. So it really, really changes the process of selling anything and makes it easier for, you know, you don't have to be a power seller on eBay. You don't have to be a professional sneaker or watch or handbag seller to be able to very, very easily sell a watch or handbag or sneaker literally within one click. You don't have to list anything. You don't have to write a description. You don't have to upload pictures. Literally just go and click sell because if they're- As long as it's brand new. As, lo as long as it's brand new and you, and you have the, the all the conditions around of what that product is, but because there are standing bids, right? It's a live market. So people have bids that are tied to their credit card or their PayPal. So that is, I mean, you can- sell it immediately, right? And that's how the market works, right? You never have to worry that you can't sell a share of Apple stock, right? Because there's always standing bids. And so that becomes a sort of bigger idea, you know, around how that how that expands and, and becomes a better place for people to buy or, or sell. But, you know, I think back to, to the specifics of the question before we went to, to that half of it is, you know, watches and handbags come next because they look almost identical to sneakers in the consumer behavior, in the way that certain brands dominate the sort of exclusive space and the resale and the secondary market. So Nike, Jordan, and Adidas and sneakers, Chanel, Louis Vuitton uh, in handbags, right? Rolex, Paddock in, in watches. It really, really is similar. And you have a big collector community and you have a lot of sort of fragmented secondary market buyers and sellers. So there's a lot, a lot of reasons why it looks really similar, why we're moving there next. But the hypothesis is that anything that's not already a purely commoditized product already, like say, uh, plastic water bottles or toilet paper that essentially have infinite supply, right? There's infinite supply of toilet paper. Right, right. And anything that's not a unique one-of-a-kind item, like a work of art or a house, anything else which has some finite quantity of supply, if you understand the demand against that supply, you can build this construct around it and you can have a consumer marketplace around it. So that becomes the idea of sort of what products might work. Right, but it but we'll we'll go out slowly from sneakers and those that look most closely to sneakers, watches, and handbags. And I especially like the fact that it's interesting to younger people. So younger people who want to begin to learn about how a market works may say, "Hey, I want to buy a pair of Air Jordans," and this is a great place to go. Josh, we're just about out of time, but in the last few seconds, just tell us where can people go to follow you and follow your work. Sure, I, stockx.com, s-t-o-c-k-x.com. Not only do you have the the marketplace to buy or sell everything, but we do a lot of data analysis and insights around the market and around this larger concept around a stock market of things. So there's a lot there in addition to just buying and selling sneakers, watches, and handbags. Fantastic. We will put a link to that at the show notes of goldsteinongelt.com. Josh Luber, thanks so much for your time. Thanks for having me. You've been listening to the Goldstein on Gelt show with Money Maven, Doug Goldstein. Check out all of Doug's money ideas at goldsteinongelt.com. Doug specializes in helping people who live outside the United States handle their U.S. investment accounts. If you have a question that you would like answered on the air or off, contact Doug at his website or send him an email to doug at profile-financial.com.